So the title of my sermon is Who Draws Near? And this morning we're going to look at this um, culturally familiar parable through the lens of the individuals in it and then we're going to move to how we are in it. We begin with the lawyer who asks the question of Jesus, who is my neighbor? In the Bible study class, we looked at uh, short stories by Jesus, and the author of the study, Amy Jill Levine, or Levine, fills in some background on the lawyer's social context as he poses this question. See, a lawyer in Jesus' time, as I was telling the children, is not a lawyer as we know it, but is a learned religious person. For our understanding, this is elucidated by Jesus asking the lawyer, what do you read there? And the lawyer recites the commandments from the Torah because he has studied and committed them to memory. Luke offers as a clue to the lawyer's religious affiliations and we can see it is not to Jesus when he, Luke, writes, just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. The religious authorities, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and lawyers test Jesus. Levine locates four indications that Luke has placed before us that Jesus was not respected by this man. Firstly, the man is a lawyer. In Luke 11, Jesus takes a lawyer to task. Jesus said, how terrible for you legal experts too. You load people down with impossible burdens and you refuse to lift a single finger to help them. This offers a clue into the mindset of our lawyer. Secondly, as mentioned, the lawyer tests Jesus. And in the Gospels, only Satan puts Jesus to the test. Thirdly, he calls Jesus teacher. And for Luke, the only respectful title given Jesus is that of Lord. And according to Levine, the fourth problem lies in the intent of the question itself. The man, Levine reveals, only wants a box to check that says, there it is, I have done this thing, tidy as that, I am now guaranteed eternal life. However, Levine notes that lawyers, being religious persons, would have been highly respected in their societies. And most people could not read, right? We're used to everybody being literate. They could not read and therefore relied on those who could teach them and guide them in keeping the law. By placing the question back in the lawyer's court, Jesus acknowledges the lawyer's learnedness. And responding to a question with a question is a traditional way, um, that uh, Jewish way of engaging in discussion. Jesus never insults this man who comes to test him. He does, though, put a new spin on the old laws. So from a legal perspective, neighbors who share nationality uh, during Jesus' time and our time are imbued with the same rights, and privileges and responsibilities. As Americans, as American citizens, that is illustrated by these practices, the right to vote, the privilege of birth, automatic citizenship to those born in the US, and the responsibility of, no groaning, of participating in the legal system as jurors. <laughs> so the lawyer legitimately asks, who is my neighbor? Given all that, found in Leviticus 19, is God commanding Moses to tell the Israelites, any immigrant who lives with you must be treated as if they were one of our citizens. You must love them as yourself because you were immigrants in the land of Egypt. Then, what does this mean? Is everyone my neighbor? So an interesting side note in Levine's dissection of this parable is the incredulity 
of who becomes my savior. And I'll explain. While I was a pastor at one of my churches, we had a terrible problem to deal with and untangle complications from it. And the church found itself in a position no church would want to be in. Things became so contentious and divided that the DS came one Sunday morning to help settle and just smooth feelings. So months into the schism, the church held a listening session. There was a woman in the congregation who could, well, she could run rather hot and cold. And amid the fomenting of rumors and untruths, one key myth began to develop. So during the listening session, one of the speakers brought forth this myth as fact. And I groaned inwardly. We would not get far in our reconciliation if this myth became set as fact. Well, the hot and cold running woman rose to her fullest stature and rebuked the myth. She did so with confidence and knowledge. And you might could have knocked me over with a feather when she stood up. She saved us, this woman who rarely gave either pastor the time of day. And from that day forward, I can be heard to remark, from whence my Savior come. From whence my Savior come. And this parable is a quintessential illustration of just this question. Because if you look at those who did not draw near to the traveler, it was his fellow citizens, those with whom he would consider he shared rights, privileges, and responsibilities. And for Jesus to include as characters in the story a priest and a Levite, the third character to follow in their cultural storytelling would naturally be an Israelite. And we are so inured to this story that we don't catch the audacity of Jesus' choice of third character, or actor, as you will, in this story. Levine tells us that for Jewish audiences, the listing of priest and Levite is similar to us hearing a list of red, white, and magenta. We'd be like, what? Magenta? Well, that, that isn't it. It doesn't belong. It doesn't belong. And neither did the Samaritans. They didn't have their sacred center as Jerusalem as did the other Jews. They worshipped on Mount Gerizim due to a marital malfunction in accordance with Jewish law. And one scholar notes that this supposed religious infraction, are you listening to this? One scholar notes that this supposed religious infraction, which created mounting animosity for centuries between the Samaritans and the Jews, was probably based on a false understanding. I bet we can believe that. How often do we hear this about long-standing family feuds when at a funeral or other gathering some family member is telling the story of what happened to create the riff and another family member says, wait, that isn't what he actually said or that isn't what he actually did. And a whole new dawning of understanding and hopefully reconciliation is brought upon those two families. Also, um, nope, that's not what it said. It said, all right. <laughs> so, after all of these tensions and aggressions against one another, the Samaritans and the Jews had become religiously and therefore socially and culturally estranged. They no longer belonged to one another. They felt they were not neighbors. But the Jew did belong to the priest, or did he? According to one source, in the first century Palestine, there was no separation of church and state. 
The priests were rulers and judges, and as such, they were no ordinary citizens. They lived in high luxury supported by a temple tax, and they lived outside of the typical Jewish experience. And the Hebrew word Pharisee means to separate. Now the Sadducees we hear about, they controlled the temple in Jerusalem and the Sanhedrin, which was the legal, the Jewish legal council. So in writing that, I wondered if our lawyer might possibly be a Sanhedrin. Anyway. A good majority of the priests played both sides, aligned with the Romans and yet taking full advantage of Jewish temple tax. So did the Jewish man in the ditch belong to the priest? Would he have seen him as a natural neighbor? Then we have the Levite coming along the road and he too hears the groans emanating from the ditch. Now, Levites were landless priests, as it were, and one source claims they were dedicated to the ritual service and sacrificial duties at the tabernacle in Canaan after the Exodus. So while the Egyptian empire was crumbling, smaller groups formed claiming their own land in the hill country. And early Israel settled around regional sanctuaries of powerful priestly clans. And as afterborn sons in a family, as in born after the firstborn, they were set aside as God's portion. The practice of setting aside a son began during times of uncertainty and economic turmoil when farmers were faced with food insecurity and unsustainability. Now in Newcastle, a place where farming and ranching are second nature, folks here understand that if there isn't enough land to be split up among siblings, someone will have to leave the land. And this is how the practice of setting aside a son came to be. It helped mediate the problem of inheritance in a land where there just wasn't much land to go around. They were sent to the priesthood as children, relieving even the burden of having to feed them and educate them throughout childhood. And parents knew the child would be fed and cared for and would always have a way to make a living. In Deuteronomy, Levites are described as belonging to no land and as having no kinsmen. So did the Jew moaning in the ditch belong to the Levite as a neighbor? And then, the shocking addition to Jesus' parable, the Samaritan comes riding along. He hears the groans. He draws near. Now, Samaritan in Hebrew means way around, over against. And look at the juxtaposition in that meaning. The others who might have been legitimate labor, neighbors to the Jewish man, as in having similar religious ties with him or to him, are the ones who find a way around him. And in turning from him are fundamentally over against his possibility of being restored to health and vitality. From whence, as Jamie, Lil, Jamie Amy Jill Levine and I exclaim, from whence his savior came. Now when we read this parable, let's consider who God asks us to consider our neighbor. Who in our world are we finding a way to ignore? Remember God's command to the Israelites? Any immigrant who lives with you must be treated as if they were one of your citizens. You must love them as yourself because you were once immigrants in the land of Egypt. So whose cries would we, proverbially speaking, because we are reading the Bible here, would we cross the street to ignore? Who are we crossing the street to ignore? And I don't mean the friend we're having a spat with either. So 
So listen to me. I know why most of you voted for Donald Trump, because I know that. The establishment candidates weren't hearing you. They didn't get that coal mining and oil refining. Finding. They are a way of life here. They are, in fact, your livelihood. It puts food on your table. It gives you some place to call home. And I get that. So in the context of our reading, can you understand that the folks trying to cross the border, ears open, hearts open, minds open, cross the border, are faced with similar fears? They want an opportunity to keep their family safe, to have a job that will feed themselves and a place to call home. It's the reason any of us came to America, you know? I wander through our Greenwood Cemetery, wondering at the lives of those who came over. Names like Faust and Josephine Musso. What danger was there in coming to this unknown territory for them? And how much loneliness and prejudice did they face? Some of them must have been awfully desperate to take the journey they did to land here in Newcastle. So the folks trying to cross the border are trying for the same thing we are and you are when we voted for a candidate you thought would hear your cries of injustice. They try to cross the border for similar reasons to Faust and Josephine and me and my family for a better way to live. At this juncture, I'm not sure if I need to say this, but I'm going to. You know the point of a sermon is not to like it, right? I want to remind you that we really need to think that everyone listening to Jesus' sermons did not like what he had to say. Like, how about that rich man he told to go and sell everything? So you don't have to like what I preach, but let it make you think on it, at the very least. Let it make you approach God's word more open to the workings of the Holy Spirit. And here we find ourselves faced with the same thorny problem as in the Bible some 3,000 years ago from Leviticus and our Psalm, and 2,000 from Jesus. How do we treat the stranger in our midst? Our job is to engage with our Christian values, to figure out, really, just to figure out a way to treat the stranger among us as humanely as is possible. And my heavens, at the very least, find it in your heart to pray for them. That is our Christian job. And our responsibility is to God's kingdom. Our responsibility is to God's and to building God's kingdom, not to building our own. Sorry, folks. To building God's kingdom. So I believe there's no way around. And Jesus' intent from this parable of who our neighbor really turns out to be? So will we hear the strangers among us groan? From whence my Savior come? Let it be so. Amen.